Shall we open our Bibles at this time to the book of Psalms, Psalm 17, verse 15, bringing a message this morning about the elusiveness of satisfaction, the elusiveness of satisfaction. What we find in human experience is what we also find reflected in Scripture, that satisfaction is a concept it is something that we desire. It is something that we see as a good thing. And yet, more often than not, we find ourselves short of it. We find ourselves pursuing it and not finding it, or only temporarily possessing it and then losing it. So it's elusive. It's an elusive thing. In uh, the book of Psalms, verse 17, uh, chapter 17, verse 15, As for me, David says, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Dear Father, I pray that you'd help us to get a good understanding of why satisfaction is so elusive and how we can have it more often and in a more rich way by having faith in you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's two things that strike me about what David said. First of all, that he believed that he would be satisfied when he saw God. But the implication is, is he wasn't yet. I shall be satisfied. If you say, I shall be satisfied, that pretty well gives it up that you're not fully satisfied now. I will behold thy face in righteousness. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about when he dies and goes to be with God, then I'll be satisfied. But the underlying thought is, <clears throat> in my life, I am not fully satisfied. There are things that aren't right, things that aren't good, things that aren't as they should be. In, in fact, for us to be satisfied... In this life, we almost have to play mind tricks on ourselves, Because if we're wide awake and paying attention and thinking, it's going to be hard to be fully, truly satisfied. Now, we can be happy, uh, we can be content, we can be a lot of things, but satisfaction comes and goes. It's an elusive thing. If there's one thing that's certain in this world, it's the fact that there's no end to the pursuit of satisfaction. It keeps being something hard to catch. Mankind is constantly striving for something more, something better, something else. It's out there. We know it's out there. And you know, there's more, better, and other out there. We know this, but really, we're not going to get more, better, and other until we get to heaven. One of the things that is difficult is that we have desires because we have this within us. We were made in the image of God. And therefore, as human beings, we innately know something in our soul that bothers us because we are estranged from God. Even though we're saved, if you're saved, you're, you're a Christian, you know the Lord, you still live in that old body of yours, and you still use that old brain of yours, and you still have that old emotional seat of yours, and it's something we're going to have to deal with till we get to heaven. Listen, David was a man of God. He believed in God. He believed he was going to see God. But he's saying, that's when I'm going to really be satisfied. As Christians, we're like travelers from another place. Now, we were born here, but when we got born again, we became citizens of heaven. So we have our identity there. And so we feel that tug. We, we, we sense that as our true home. And, and that's really a good thing because, you know, here's how we can look at it. Uh, right now, we're just kind of camping out. Now, what's, what's strange about us, uh, people that camp? You leave a perfectly comfortable home that you spent a lot of money to make comfortable. And you leave it. You leave that perfectly comfortable home to go somewhere where it's pretty well guaranteed you're going to experience some discomforts. You're, if it's warm, you're going to be hot. If it's cold, you're going to be cold. Uh, instead of having everything easy, everything's harder. Uh, and yet you do it with a smile on your face because it's fun. And, but, you know, to me, the most fun is going back home. 
Listen, I, one time I went out uh, hunting, and uh, I was with a fella, and we were in this tiny little camper and, and with these little hard bunks, you know, and it was like four degrees outside. Uh, and we didn't have enough propane to, to run the, uh, uh, the, the heater so that it was really warm. So we kept it somewhere around 30, you know, just to keep from dying, basically. And, uh, you know, I, I had a, a, a warm sleeping bag and I had my, my long handles on and I had my wool hat over my bald head. And even so, I was laying there just shivering, thinking, why did I leave my warm, comfortable bed? And my beautiful, warm wife to come out here and sleep in this thing with this dude. Only to get up and, and, and eat a, 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 a barely passable breakfast and trudge around in three foot of snow looking for an elk that I probably won't ever see. And when I finally got home, I, th I said to myself, I don't know if I want to do that again. You know, uh, I wanted to be home. You know, well, listen, this world has some fun. There's some things we can do here, but nothing compares to what we're going to. And when we get there, we won't want to come back here. So in a sense, satisfaction, true satisfaction cannot be found in this life. We can achieve it spiritually. We can achieve it in our minds and hearts through faith. Uh, another place in the Psalms, David put it this way. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. His number one focus was God. Now let's look at some things that sometimes people try to look at to find satisfaction. And we're going to show that it's elusive. It's something that uh, is not going to be found through these things. First of all, satisfaction is not going to be found through material possessions. People try to do that, don't they? If I can just acquire some stuff, if I can just get some things that, that I want to have, then I'll be satisfied. The endless pursuit of things is frustrating because just as soon as you obtain what you sought, there's something else out there to desire. Uh, perhaps it's a, a better one of that same thing, or perhaps they invent something that's new. Uh, have you ever thought of the things that we have now that are basically, uh, you know, they, they didn't have them for most of the world's history, and we have them now, and they're basically indispensable now? Have you ever thought about that? I mean, what if somebody came into your house and says, okay, we're confiscating all the microwave ovens. You've got to give it up. Well, where am I going to heat up my coffee? Well, people used to do that in a pot. I don't want to use a pot. I like the microwave. I just pour it. I put it in there. One minute, boom, hot coffee. How am I going to make my popcorn? Well, in, a, in an old-fashioned popcorn maker over the fire. I don't want to do that. I want to put it in the microwave. Uh, it, it's indispensable now. We, we, we just can't do without it. You think about this. Uh, most of us having this, this cell phone thing we have. I mean, it used to be a phone was screwed to the wall, had a wire on it. And in my day, you had to pick up the phone and find out there was another person on it on the party line. And you had to ask, could I use the phone after you're done? And, and deal with that. I don't know if any of you had that. I, I'm dating myself, you know. Uh, but, but now... You just got to have that, that cell phone. Uh, material possessions. Uh, Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it this way. You say, if I had a little more, I should be satisfied. You make a mistake. If you are not content with what you have, you would not be satisfied if it were doubled. Eric Fromm said this, Greed is a bottomless pit which exhausts the person in an endless effort to satisfy the need without ever reaching satisfaction. Somebody asked Rockefeller one time, How much does it take to make a rich man feel good. How much does it take for you to be satisfied? And he says one word, more. Now, the, you know what the problem with more is? There's always more. I don't care how much you get. If, if, listen, if it takes more for you to be satisfied, when you get that, more is still out there. You get jaded, you get used to what you're having, it becomes commonplace, 
And that desire, that urge is still there. And I don't care how rich you get, how much uh, possessions you may acquire, uh, you're going to still have that thing out there. Somebody's got a better house than me somewhere. Some God body's got a better boat. Somebody's got a better motor home. Somebody's got a better fill in the blank. And it's still going to nag at you. Satisfaction cannot be found in material possessions. Also, satisfaction cannot be found in man's philosophy. Now, now philosophy can be a good thing. Uh, basically, philosophy is just a way of looking at life. It's a way of assessing what we see. Uh, but there's so many different philosophers and so many different philosophies, uh, and many of these oppose one another and are contradictory to one another. Uh, which one are you going to pick? Well, unless your ideology and unless your philosophy is drawn from the Word of God, you've just got one more guessing game from some man whose intellect uh, is deficient and whose, uh, who, whose mind may not go all the way to the top. Uh, you know, I would rather trust the philosophy of an old Missouri farmer uh, than most of the people who have come out of Harvard or Yale that claim to be philosophers. Uh, that fella who's the farmer in Missouri uh, makes more sense than a lot of them put together. All the thinking man has done, all the thinking that mankind has done has led to depression. Uh, have any of you read the book of Ecclesiastes recently? Solomon, the wisest man in the world, had a depression fit that he, he spent several chapters just trying to describe. He said, it's meaningless. It's vanity. It's like chasing the wind. Listen, the smartest man in the world, other than our Savior Jesus Christ, looked at all of what he saw and with his mind, and he said, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have any meaning. The only way he got out of it is to get to Scripture, to get to God, and that's how he pulled himself out. Ecclesiastes 1.8, one of the things that he said, All things are full of labor. Man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What Solomon is saying here, no matter how much you think about it, there's more to think. No matter how many times you think you've got it figured out, there's another angle that you haven't got figured out. C.S. Lewis said, if the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. Now, now, now we gotta, we got to go back and get that again. If you're like me, some of the things C.S. Lewis says I have to hear twice or three times, okay? If the whole universe has no meaning, we should never have found out that it has no meaning. Just as if there were no light in the universe, and therefore no creatures with eyes, we should never know it was dark. Dark would be without meaning. Now what he's saying is, this longing that we have for understanding... This longing that we have for being able to figure it out means there's something that does have meaning. There's something that can be figured out. It's just elusive. Because we can think things should be right, there's something called right. Because we can think that there's evil in the world, we know that evil exists compared to something that's right. That means we're made in the image of God. We have His mark upon our soul. One thing I've noticed and you've perhaps noticed as well, is just how much hatred atheists seem to have for this God that doesn't exist. I've never awakened in the morning seething with rage and wanting to write an entire book to debunk the Easter Bunny or the Tooth Fairy or Santa Claus or John Bunyan or any of the legendary or fictitious characters that we may have. I've never said it just galls me to no end that some people believe Superman is real. Now, you know, when I was a kid, there were kids who thought they could fly if they put on a Superman cape. So they'd jump off something high and break their leg. I knew better. I knew you had to have the whole suit. <laughs> just the cape wouldn't do it. People have these ideas. They, they, they're limited in their knowledge. They, they're angry at God. And really what it is, they're, they're angry at themselves. Listen, we're at an impasse with God. God who is perfect and cannot change and will not change. 
And we who should change must change and should choose to change. And that's an impasse. We don't tell God to repent. He's not going to. Doesn't need to. God tells us to repent because we do need to and we must. And we're at an impasse. And until we agree with God about us, we're going to have that impasse. Man's philosophy is not going to bring satisfaction. In fact, it brings the opposite. The more you think, the sadder you're going to be. The more you exercise your mind in human philosophy, the more depressed you're going to be. You're going to have to take uh, medicine every day uh, just to keep from wanting to uh, end your own life if all you have is man's philosophy. God has a greater mind than any man can even comprehend. Isaiah 55, let's look at verses 1 through 9. This is just a good passage of Scripture. I want us to read this entire passage. Isaiah 50, 55, verses 1 through 9. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight in its fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and a commander to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not. And nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God. And for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. This is speaking of the kingdom to come. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God. For listen, he will abundantly pardon. That's what people need. They need pardoning. They need forgiving. That's what God offers. It's what he dispenses to those that come to him. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now God is reminding all of humanity that he is the ultimate in wisdom. He is the ultimate in truth. And we cannot match him in a game of wits. We cannot win an argument with God. We cannot educate him. We cannot improve him. We cannot defy him. He is what we need. And so we should come to him for pardon. So material possessions will not bring satisfaction. You're going to always want more. Man's philosophy is just a mind trick. It only works for a while, and then it comes up empty. Then there's mortal pleasures. Mortal pleasures, the things of this life, having fun, enjoying life. Now, there's some pleasures in life that are forbidden by God, sinful and wrong, and things that we are commanded not to do. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the things that God allows us to have that are good and healthy. Uh, and, and, and in fact, he, he expects us to pray for and want and desire and, and will give us uh, the pleasures of life, the normal things. Uh, there's a lot of joy in living. I don't know about you, but I enjoy my meals. I'm glad that I have a high metabolism and stay fairly active because my wife is such a good cook. That if it weren't for my high metabolism and the fact that I'm active, I, I would probably have to cut back, you know. But as it is, she makes some pie. I'm going to eat it. She makes a delicious casserole. I might have a second helping. Why? Because I love the enjoyment of eating. You know, my, my grandma, bless her heart, my grandma was a good cook, country cook, like a lot of old grandmas are down, down in the deep south. And uh, she went to the doctor one time because she wasn't feeling well, and the doctor took her off salt. Imagine telling a, a country grandma, no more salt, no more salt. It's the same thing as saying no more fun, no more enjoyment of life. And I can remember one time her sitting at, at the table and she was eating a saltless meal and literally tears were coming down her face. 
And she prayed, Lord, please let me get to where I can have salt again. And she was just so sad because, you know, she was just one of these cooks that really enjoyed her food. And it was one of the few pleasures of life that she had. Well, finally, you know, they started making salt substitutes and other things like that. And she got to where she could do that, learn how to cook without so much salt. And she got over it because it added some time to her life. That was a good thing. But, you know, to take away your pleasures, it's a hard thing to take. Mortal pleasures do not satisfy as much as remind us of the fact that enjoyment does exist and satisfaction can exist. You know, when you experience a high, when you have something wonderful happen in your life, uh, that makes you feel good. You want more of that. You want that to happen again. Uh, One of the things that keeps people in their hobbies is the the satisfaction they get out of uh, creating something or making something or perhaps uh, selling something or or in sports. Uh, uh, I'm not good at golf. Some of you fellows have golfed with me and I could get a witness on that. But every now and then I square up on one and I hit that ball exactly where I intended to hit it uh, with just the right swing. And I think I could do that again. It was so enjoyable. It was so fun and so rewarding. I get that high. Oh, wow, that worked. And then I try it again, and it doesn't work again. I was lifted high for a moment, thinking, yeah, I'm a golfer, only to be reminded the next stroke, no, I'm not. But you see, that exists to let me know it's possible. It's possible, but... Life comes along and says, yeah, it's possible, but not for you. And so many things are like that. Isn't that true? Pleasure is almost like a, you know, a liar, a cheater. Here it is. Nah, you can have it, but not for long. You're really great. Not really. You can do it. No, you can't. It pulls us this way and that, these mortal pleasures. The reason we long for more is because we know there is more. Every now and then, when I'm playing softball, I'll make a really good swing. I'll hit the sweet spot. I'll grunt real loud. I'll have a tailwind on the ball. The barometric pressure is just right. Maybe a a fly got under it and helped it. And I'll clear the fence. And I have that high. I had a home run. So I think I can do that again. And I find out I can also pop out a lot too. These are the kind of things that mortal pleasures can do. It's fun, but it's not satisfying. It, it, It doesn't carry you through. It's just a temporary high. Proverbs 14, 13 says this, even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. Now think about it. Even in laughter, the heart is sorrowful. And the end of that mirth is heaviness. Now, now what the writer is saying here, even when you're laughing, you realize I'm not going to laugh tomorrow probably. Even when you're happy, there's something in you that reminds you, I'm not always going to be this happy. Ecclesiastes 6, 7, all the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the appetite is not filled, is not satisfied. Think of all the time you spend on just this body, just this thing we walk around in, this thing our soul lives in. We wash it, we groom it, we cut what hair is left of it, we doctor it. We feed it, all of that so we can function. And then we have our physical surrounding, furniture, air conditioning, heat. We were talking in Sunday school uh, this morning about how much time we Americans spend on grass. Grass. We fertilize it. We water it. We weed it for the wonderful privilege of cutting it down to size, and then start the process all over again, just so our neighbors won't walk by and say, well, look at that yard. That's really what it's about, isn't it? Don't tell me you don't do it. When you go on your walks, you look at it. That guy doesn't cut his grass. 
Mm, hours and hours and hours for grass. We spend a lot of time on stuff that when you think about it, when it, when it compared to eternity, it means absolutely nothing. I don't think I'm going to get to heaven and there's going to be a special prize there for best yard. I just don't see that coming, you know. Listen, have you ever thought about this? We want happiness, we want satisfaction, but here's that we pray, Lord, Lord, help me to be satisfied with what I have. Help me to have a good life. Help, give me purpose. But here's the thing. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. There's no such thing. Apart from God, true satisfaction and true happiness does not exist. And so if we want it, we've got to go to God to get it. That's the only place it exists. It cannot be found anywhere. So for, for Christians, we do have an edge. We do have an advantage over the lost in that we know there is a, a, a thing called righteousness. There is a thing called good. There is a thing called more. And listen, when we get to heaven, believe me, it's going to be good, it's going to be better, and it's going to be more, and it's going to be other than. It's going to be wonderful. The more you realize how wonderful heaven is, the easier it is to take this place. And we are all camping out. So we don't need to drive our tent stakes too deep. One day God's going to call us, and we're going to leave. So true satisfaction can only be found, and here it is, in Messiah's promises. Now, David did not know his name would be Jesus. David did not know a lot of the things that we know because we've got the New Testament to read about it. But one thing David did know, there's a Messiah who's coming. There is a Savior who's coming. Every time David sacrificed a lamb or a bullock on the altar, it was pointing to the one who would come and pay the atonement for the sins of the whole world. Every time David placed his head on that animal and the knife was drawn and the blood was spilled, David was testifying, I understand that sin requires a sacrifice. Sin requires an atonement. And he looked forward in faith to the one that would come, Messiah. And so when David was talking about satisfaction, he was looking forward to seeing the face of his Savior. And he says, then will I be satisfied when I awake. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? When you go to sleep, when you die, the Bible calls it sleep. You fall asleep. You die, you fall asleep. But no sooner do you fall asleep than you're present with the Lord. You fall asleep here and you wake up with the likeness of God before you. He said, when I awake with thy likeness. When I see you, I'll be satisfied. Until then, we've got work to do, don't we? We've got things we can do. Don't expect a whole lot of satisfaction. Enjoy the trip. Enjoy what you have. Listen, we're blessed. <laughs> we're blessed. It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? Uh, rather than looking at the people who have more, it makes more sense to look around at the people who have far less and be grateful that we have enough, that we're okay. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I look around and I see people who uh, I think you probably eat every day. You have clothes to wear. Uh, let, me, let me ask just this question. Does, does anybody here have anything? In, it's, a, it's a certain device, a certain article that is mass produced, and all of us have one. Does anybody in this church not have coat hangers? You've all got them. I've got coat hangers. You've got coat hangers? We're Rich. Rich we got to have a place to put our extra clothes. You realize that in the history of the world, most of the people who lived had one set of clothes, the one they were wearing, and maybe the one that was on a hook somewhere. The very fact that we have clothes hangers tells us we're living in a time and a place where we are wonderfully better off than the history of the world's people has ever had. We have much to be thankful for. John Piper said this, and I agree with it. He is most glorified, speaking of God, He is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. The time that we are close to God and thankful and grateful and happy that He has blessed us so, that is when we are happy. And I believe with all my heart, you cannot be happy without gratitude. 
Ungrateful people are not happy people. It is impossible. If you are ungrateful, you will not be happy. On the other hand, if you are grateful, you will be happy. 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. In other words, there's a difference between the saved and the lost in the world. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Now what the Bible is saying here is if we have our minds and hearts focused on Jesus Christ and seeing him, then we have the ability to be happy. We have the ability to, to feel satisfied in him. 1 Corinthians thirteen twelve. For now we see through a glass darkly. Now what that means is through faith, we have the ability to see the truths of God. We see heaven, we see Jesus, but we do this through faith as if through a glass darkly, but then face to face. True lasting satisfaction can only be found in God and ultimately can only be found when we give up this mortal life and go to be with Him. But until then, satisfaction may be elusive. It may come and go. But contentment and gratitude toward God can help us have a sense of satisfaction much more if we exercise those things before God. We have so many things to thank Him for. So many things that the rest of the world just wishes they could have and do not, and we take them quite for granted. We should be happy. We should be satisfied. Now, there's some things we should not be satisfied about. We should never be satisfied in our Christian growth. We should always be hoping to grow more. But we can enjoy the trip as we go. Amen. We have the ability to stop and reflect and say, Lord, I'm not everything I should be. I'm not everything I could be. But thank God I'm not what I was. Thank God that you have taken me this far. And stop and praise him and thank him and be happy and be satisfied. Because true satisfaction can only be found through Jesus Christ. Dear Father, I pray that you'd help us to understand why satisfaction is so elusive for we mortal people. But Lord, help us also to understand that we can enjoy it. We can achieve it. And we can live with it more often and in a greater way when we keep our minds and hearts focused on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, in you, we can be happy. We can be satisfied. We can be content. We pray that we would focus on you more often and be able to witness for you and bring others to the saving knowledge of Christ so that they too can find the answers to life's problems. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.